All right, we're going to do uh, some things just a little different here, <clears throat> and we're going to open up the message by actually inviting you into a question. And so again, if you were here at the beginning, you heard me say, hopefully you're not sitting beside someone too scary. I have noticed that several of you moved when I said that. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to invite you to turn to a neighbor around you, and if you're, listen, we have the power to save marriages, okay, right here, check this out. If you're like my wife and I, sometimes by the time we get done at the end of the day, like we're too exhausted even to talk, so you may have the most intimate conversation with your spouse you've had all week right here this Sunday morning, and so we're saving your marriage right now, okay? So here's what we want you to do. We want you to turn to someone next to you or someone around you, and you may have to move. You may have to say, hey, I'm, no one's sitting next to me. Uh, I'm going to look around and find somebody else who doesn't have someone sitting next to them. But what we want you to do is we want you to, to have a small conversation real quick about what causes you stress and why. What causes you stress and what, was there like a pterodactyl over here? What, right? what causes you stress and why? It may be, hey, my job causes me stress because my boss, because there's too much to do, because there's not enough to do. Uh, we're worried about getting work. Well, maybe it is my kids cause me stress because they keep making stupid decisions. Maybe it's my parents cause me stress. Like I'm trying to figure out what nursing home I got to help mom get into or can I get mom or meds? Can I take care of dad? Again, whatever it is that causes you stress. We've got about two or three minutes, and what we want to do is just open up saying, hey, turn to your neighbor and just talk to them about this is what it is that causes me stress, and this is why. Don't just say this is what it is. Tell us why, okay? You ready? Again, if you got to move, that's okay. Now, if you are terrified of people, you're like an introvert, and you're like, I do not want to do this, here's the secret. Just put your head down. Everybody will think you're deep in a moment of prayer with God, and no one will interrupt you. But if you are like, hey, I'd like to talk to someone, feel free to get up and move. Okay, you ready? we got about two or three minutes. Go! All right, so you're stressed out about it, you're thinking about it, you're overwhelmed about it. All right, and here's, you already know the answers to this. How many of you, by thinking about it, by being stressed about it, fixed it? No hands went up. Like, you were like, hey, I'm worried about this, and you, you lost sleep over it. Did it fix it? Did it make it better? No. Right? You got an ulcer, but it didn't make it better, right? How many of you, by worrying about it, like thinking about it, playing the scenario over and over in your head, how it's going to go different? Well, how many of you, how many of you by just, just pondering it, made it better? No, no one does. And, and yet, this is the way we live, right? We live just constantly in a state of, I'm worried about something, we fret about it, we have anxiety about it, and yet, in the back of our minds, we know, I'm not really doing anything to fix it. I'm not really changing the world at all. I'm not making it matter, all right? And here's what I want you to know. Often, if you trace the core, I mean, I'm not talking about the surface, I'm saying go all the way to the core of that anxiety, all the way to the core of that anxiety, it often ends up that we're not sure at the end God wins. Okay, what I mean by that is at the very core of your anxiety, you're going, hey, is, is, is God powerful enough that when I pray that he's going to save my marriage? Is God powerful enough that when I pray... He's going to come to the rescue of this. Is God powerful enough that in the end, in the end, that God wins? Because we have a doubt way back in the back of our mind, we tend to worry about temporary things because we don't understand the bigger picture. We wonder if at the end God wins. I was in a hospital... And I was standing beside a gentleman as the doctors were explaining to him kind of the last ditch effort. He was about to go into a trial phase of chemo. And he was going to have to fly to another city to even get this experimental drug. But the cancer and the treatments they had been doing were failing. He was a young father. And he, when I met this guy, he was a big dude big strong dad and had this huge laugh and these giant hands and when I saw him now he looked like a frail skeleton and that was just one of those visits where you happen to show up at the right time as they're walking him through the 
information, and I said, you want me to stay? He goes, no, no, stay. And so we stayed in the room, and, and, and they, they walked him through everything. And, and, you know, the doctor said to him, you know, you, you don't have to do this. It's up to you. Because the, the end of this is not guaranteed. I can't tell you it'll work. I can't tell you that it won't. I can tell you what happens if you don't take this treatment, but I can't tell you what will. And the doctors left, and we stayed in the room, and I'm sitting beside him, and it was like forever in silence we sat. And he's just staring at his hospital bed up at those ceiling tiles. I don't know if he was counting the holes in him, you know how that works. And I didn't know what to say other than I just wanted to be there for my friend. And finally he kind of turned around and he said to me, I just want to know the answer to one question. Okay. He said, in the end, does God win? He said, I want to know if in the end, I'm going to be able to see my kids again. I want to know if in the end, all this is worth fighting for. I want to know if in the end, any of this really, really matters. Listen, when we do a study of Revelation... All right. One of the reasons that we look at it is because we wonder at, in the end, does God win? Because life is difficult. Life's hard. Life gets dark, right? And we wonder ourselves, hey, marriages fall apart. Is God going to win in the end? Crime is all over the news. Is God going to win? Overdoses are taking place left and right. Is God going to win? Children are abused by their own parents. Is God going to win? Loved ones suffer from dementia. Is God going to win? North Korea has got nuclear bombs. Is God going to win? Atheist evangelists are on TV explaining why God's dead and the belief in Him is not rational and that it is actually detrimental to your health. Is God going to win? When my faith starts to stare at the darkness and I ask God, are you here even in the shadows? You know, we say Psalm 23, even in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because God is with me. Is that a, a prayer that David wrote hoping that would take place? Or is it a prayer that God has promised to David that says, I will be with you even there? It is a prayer that claims the promise of God and we can believe it because we know the end of the story. God wins. That's how my aunt reads a book, by the way. She goes to the bookstore. She pulls a book off the shelf that she thinks might be interesting. She reads the first chapter at the store and then flips to the last chapter and reads the last chapter at the store. Now, first of all, I can't read that fast because they would start charging me admission, okay? So I, I couldn't do that if I wanted to. But that's how she buys a book. She goes to the bookstore, she reads the first chapter, and she decides if I like the way it began, and then she reads the last chapter, and I like the way it ends, I'll read the rest of the book. Now, here's the good news. This is exactly the way the Bible has been written. God knows and God knew that you and I would lose hope, that you and I would struggle to say things in this life are tough. Is it going to be worth it? We would lose focus if we did not already have the end and have the knowledge that God wins in the end. My dad watches football like this. He says live games stress him out too much. He says he watches Ohio State games and he records it, he DVRs it, and he finds out if they won or lost. And if they've won, he'll go back and watch the game. <clears throat> but if they've lost, he's not going to watch the game because he'll be too stressed out. And he says, I know that if we win, no matter how bad it gets in the middle, no matter how terrible the offense is playing, no matter how many interceptions, I sit there and I go, it's going to be okay because we win. Right? This is the way we do life. Okay? If we could get a big picture focus and go, you know what, it doesn't matter what we endure now, I know the end, in the end, God wins. No matter what we're going through right now, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big a deal. In fact, <coughs> Paul wrote as much. He said in Romans 8, 18-21, I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. He says, look, there's going to be a day 
when Jesus comes back and the glory of God will be revealed in us and our present sufferings aren't even worth holding up to them. They're not even worth saying, hey, does this compare to this? It's not even worth comparing. For creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. It goes on and talks about the birth pains that all creation is enduring and all creation waiting in eager expectation for God to come again. Because we know the end, what we're enduring now isn't even worth comparing to one another. There's a song that I have sang that has become one of our family hymns. It is because he lived. We just sang it. And I have sang it at the birth of every one of my kids. And I remember when Kara was born, I remember holding little Kara, because she was like this, actually, back then. She came out that tall. And uh, she was like a subway sub. And so I'm holding Kara, and uh, I remember watching the news, and there was just this terrible, terrible story about all the violence that was going on, and there was this drug ring, and I mean, it, it was terrible. And I remember staring down at my little girl, and I remember thinking to myself this. I prayed, I don't know if you know this, I prayed that our first kid would be a boy. I did. God answered. That's one of the few prayers that I know God absolutely answered. Because I said to God, God, if I mess it up, at least let it be a boy first. All right? And maybe I'll get it right by the time I get a girl. But if you drop a boy and he gets scarred, it's no big deal, right? But if you drop a girl and she's got this big gash on her face, like you're like, oh, I'm so sorry I did that to you. So I prayed that we'd have a boy first and that, that I wouldn't mess it up too bad and that by the time we got to an, another child, that maybe I would have it figured out which I never did really figure it out, but uh, we had Kara, and I remember holding her, thinking to myself, if she has any of her mother's genetics, she's going to be gorgeous. And she's going to have boys chasing her like crazy. And then I'm going to go to jail because I'm going to murder these guys. <laughs> and it's just bad, right? And I remember watching this news thing come on about all the terrible things going on right now. And I remember just staring up at that and holding my daughter and going, what are we doing? How can we be parents of a child when this is the world we're saying, here, we're giving you this place. We've messed it up. And it was almost like the Holy Spirit said, it's time to sing the song. And so we sang. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy she gives. But greater still, the calm assurance that this child can face whatever's going on. Because he lives. And in the end, we win. Amen? In the end, we win. No matter what you're going through, line it up to the end, no big deal. And again, if you and I can keep the end of the game in mind, you've DVR'd it, God wrote it down for you. So wrote the book of Revelation said, this is what it looks like. If you can keep that in mind, whatever you're going through, pales so much that we can't even compare it. I have a friend who uh, understood this, and uh, we were talking about, hey, how should we live then if we know the end and that, that Jesus is going to return? And uh, she talked about a big party that she had growing up. And she said, I invited a few friends, and if you have ever been to one of these parties, the few friends turned in like the entire county, right? And people were showing up that she didn't, it was one of those parties, you know what I'm talking about? And, and... Uh, her big brother came over and kind of rescued her and chased everybody away. And uh, the, then he said to her, Mom and Dad are coming back tomorrow. You, you're going to have to deal with this. And she talked about how they were cleaning up beer bottles and cans out of the yard and even trying to rake the tire marks out of the yard that night. And uh, she was getting ready because she was afraid. Of, like, hey, Mom and Dad, get back. They're going to find out. Now, this is how many of us live into... The idea that Jesus is coming back in the book of Revelations has the end already written. We live into it going, I hope Jesus doesn't catch me. 
which isn't really biblical at all. Again, that's a demented, warped view of God that he's some sign of Santa Claus waiting for you to mess up. Making a list, checking it twice, right? That's stalker Santa Claus. That's how many of us view Jesus, unfortunately, right? And the reality of it is, is that it's a messed up view of God's laws and God's will for your life. You see, it goes all the way back to the very first temptation in the garden. Do you remember the story? All right, the, the gorilla comes out and says to Eve, eat the Snickers bar. Just checking to see who was awake there, okay? Remember the story? There's a snake in the tree, and the snake says, Did God really say? And if I could just paraphrase that for you, the snake says, Is God really giving you what's best for you, or is he holding out the best for you? Right? If you eat this fruit, you'll know. And you'll have the ability to choose for yourself. God's been holding out on you. God's been holding out out on you. And so many of us live as if God's holding out on us. Like, hey, there is more fun stuff to do if we just live how we want, not how God wants, because we don't really believe God's good. That he has what's best in mind for us. Megan always uses the illustration that her, her mom and dad would send her to bed, right? And that she knew, going to bed, that that meant every night they had a wild party. And they were sending her to bed because she, they did not want her to enjoy the party that they had at night. And I think it's a great illustration. That her parents didn't really want her to enjoy life. They were sending her to bed because she was mean. It wasn't because they know Megan gets grouchy when she doesn't get enough sleep. Or that Megan needed sleep. Or that Megan needed all the energy she needed for the next day. They didn't want her to experience the joy of life, right? And this is how many of us view God. Right? Jesus is coming. I got to get all of the fun in I can before he gets back. But there's another way to view it. What if God's good? And what if instead of hoping that I get my life cleaned up before the party, I just say, I'm going to live for God's glory. So, uh, I did Thursday, Friday, Saturday at a horse clinic with uh, Ken McNabb. He's a national horse trainer. And uh, I've got to be honest, I'm a little sore and somewhat chafed because we were on a horse about nine hours a day. And uh, I listened to Ken talk. He's a very godly horse trainer, one of the reasons I love going to him. And uh, he started to tell the story one day, and it's just a beautiful story. And he said, we had a girl from Boston who wanted the intern. And she was talking to him about the internship, and she said, Ken, I want to do everything. I want to come out. I want to work the horses. I want to learn how to do this. But, Ken, you got to understand, I come from a gang, and I've got this drug background. And she goes, I just want you to know, I don't think I can do the Jesus stuff that you keep talking about. And Ken talked to her for a while, and she finally said, you know, I'll just come, and I'll just ignore that stuff. Ken said, you don't have to like it. Just know it's who we are. And so she went. Six months later, she gives her life to Jesus. Six months later, she gives her life to Jesus, and she had such a great time of such a, a, an amazing transformation that Ken hired her on to work full-time at the ranch. And so she runs part of the business, and she handles the interns now. All right, the street gang drug girl from Boston helps Ken do stuff now. And so there's an intern that, called, that came in and was in Montana. They were talking to her and Ken goes, I walked into the back of the shop. They didn't know I was there, but I was overhearing the conversation. He goes, I was eavesdropping. It's okay. Uh, and, and he said, I'm listening to my Boston girl talk to another girl. And she, the other girl says, I just don't know that I can handle all the Jesus stuff. And he's like, how funny is it that she's telling the Boston girl about Jesus, right? And so he's listening because he wants to hear what she's going to say. And he goes, she was great. She was very sympathetic, very patient. And she finally said to the girl, you know what? I was just like you. She goes, I just want you to know one thing. When I was doing drugs and I was running with the gangs and I was doing all that stuff, I never had as much fun as I do here working 20 hours a day busting my tail living for Jesus. Whatever you're going to be worried about giving up, it pales in comparison to what you're going to experience here. Ken goes, I tell you what, it was one of the most proud moments of my life, just hearing someone proclaim the gospel, that what God has in store for us and the way he wants us to live is so much better than anything else the world, than anything else the world could offer. All right, how will Jesus come back? If we're talking about the end times, we should know how is he coming back, right? We're going to be ready for it. How do we know he didn't already come back? Do you know when we did the time change here? This was funny. 
two years ago, we did the time change here, and one of the older ladies showed up for the first service. Of course, she was an hour early, right? And she walks in, and there's like nobody here but me and the lady doing the coffee. And she walks in, and I hear her out there, but I don't, you know, someone's here early, no big deal. And I come out a little bit later, and she's sitting at this chair, and she looks terrible. And I go, are you okay? And she goes, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're here, Pastor. I thought the rapture happened, and I was the only one left. And I said, well, bad news, it did happen, and you and I are it, right? <laughs> How do we know it didn't already happen? You know, when the eclipse happened last week, I got so many emails and so many texts and so many Facebook messages asking me, is this the end? Because there were people on TV and there were people on the Internet saying, hey, this is it, this is a sign, this is what we've been waiting for, right? And all I could think of was the movie Ghostbusters, the original one. Do you remember the original, like those of you that are old enough, remember the original one, right? And the containment unit blows up, right? And the, the, the lightning and stuff is shooting in the sky. And the, the crazy dude's walking around going, it's a sign, it's a sign. And the secretary looks at him and goes, it's a sign, all right. I'm out of a job, right? Sorry, that's where my head went, all right? Here's what I want you to know. We have people on a regular basis who run around telling you, this is it, this is the end, we've got to get it ready, we've got to go, blah, 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 right? And I call that crazy preacher guy. And you know these people, like they show up on college campuses and give the rest of us a bad name, right? Because this crazy preacher guy that's just spouting off these half-truths, and I really believe at the core they love Jesus, they've just been misdirected and, and warped and stuff, and I keep praying that the holy hitmen will just take them out because they need to go to heaven and be with Jesus anyways. They're more holy than the rest of us. I think it would solve the problem. The news wouldn't be able to pick on us as much, and it would help our witness to the rest of the world. God, just take them out right now. They need to be with you, right? right? And, and so you have the crazy guy, and because of crazy guy, we don't talk about the end time very much. But we know the end of the book. We know the end of the story. We know that God wins, and so we never tell anybody, and then people wander around going, hey, is this guy on news, right? Is this guy over here writing this book, right? It's, I read the tabloid in the Kroger line. It says Jesus is coming next week. It says that Joe's got it on his microwave, and it's slowly counting down. Right? And here's what's happened. Our culture has been more influenced and we have more information about Jesus coming back that's influenced by the H than the B. What I mean by that is we have more influence and more knowledge about what Jesus is doing when he comes back influenced by Hollywood than we do by the Bible. So let's take a moment and say, hey, how will Jesus come back? Because if he comes back, I'd like to know it. Let me tell you, you're not going to miss it. Ready? 1 Thessalonians says this. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. With the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive, who are left, will be caught up. Going up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. How awesome is that? Right? All you white guys that wonder why you can't jump, there's going to be a day when you get a jump. You may not come back down, but you get a jump, all right? It's going to be a big one, right? All right, there's going to be a day when God shows up. No one's going to miss it. You don't have to wonder, did I miss it? Did, you know, I showed up at church and everybody's gone but me, all right? Everybody's going to know there's going to be a trumpet blast. Everybody's going to hear it. And by the way, in my world, I don't think it's so much a trumpet blast. I think the trumpet blast is going to sound like a dinner bell. Ding, 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 all right? It's because it's time for the family reunion, right? We're going to get to go to heaven. We're going to have a big feast with God. That's in my head. That's what it sounds like, all right? So the Bible says that Jesus come back. Just like he left, he left ascending to heaven. He's going to come back descending back to earth. And we're going to meet him midway in the clouds. All right? And it's a metaphor for all relationships that we should all meet midway. No, it's really just how Jesus come back, right? And we're going to meet him up in the clouds. And that's how it's going to be. It's not going to be a secret. It's not going to be a mystery. It's not going to be hidden. When it happens, everyone will know about it. Everyone will hear about it. And we'll all see what's going on. Okay? So Jesus is coming back. That's what we believe as a church, and we're going to meet him in the sky. We're going to meet him in the sky. Jesus then warned us. He said, now look, don't be deceived. There are going to be people running around saying, hey, he's back, he's back, he's back. There's going to be people running around saying, hey, this time has happened. This is already here. He's saying, hey, this is going to happen. In fact, Scripture says in Matthew 24, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars. That sounds like today or 100 years ago or 200 years ago, right? But see to it that you are not alarmed. Don't panic. 
Right? Don't become a crazy preacher man. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise up against nation. Which, by the way, a better translation of that is actually race will rise up against race. Do we have any racial tension in our country right now? There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are what? The beginning of the birth pains. The beginning. The beginning of the birth pains. There are people who try to associate every war, every phenomenon, every news event with, hey, this is coming. And then there are people who don't care at all. And I would just like to say to you that I think the healthy place to be as a good good. Uh, Christian is somewhere in the middle saying, you know what, I'm just going to be aware that there are birth pains taking place for us right now. I'm not going to go over nuts over here, and I'm also not going to ignore it, and I'm just going to claim there are birth pains going on, and I want to be ready no matter when it happens. I want to be ready no matter when it happens. So Jesus is coming back real soon, right? Maybe tomorrow, Scripture says, live as if it is going to happen today. Live as if it is going to happen today. And so here's kind of, for me, where the rubber meets the road when I study Revelation. It changes, again, how I live today. Because I know that God wins, and I also therefore know that life is short and temporary. It forces me to prioritize my life. Psalm 90, verse 12. David is praying, so teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us the number of days. Teach us so that we can prioritize our life because we know that Jesus wins in the end. Therefore, I shouldn't get so overwhelmed and burdened and excited about things that aren't important and I should live differently in my daily life. Let me just give you this example. How many of you that have had kids or how many of you that were kids remember your parents yelling at you for jumping in the mud puddles with your Shoes on. I had it with some lady in the first service go, your clothes on. I went, that's a deep mud puddle, okay? We, all right. Well, yeah, you don't get in the mud puddle with your shoes on. Why? Because your shoes are going to get ruined, which is a fact. If you play in a mud puddle long enough, your shoes will get ruined. You know what? When my kids were little, all of a sudden a little light bulb went off because I was like, don't get out of that. We don't have much money. Your shoes are going to get ruined. And I was all excited and I wanted to chase my kids out of the mud puddle. And then a little light bulb went off. I said, you know what? Your kids grow out of every pair of shoes long before they ever get ruined. Like, you have never thrown your kids' shoes away because they were ruined. You have given them away or thrown them away because they outgrew them. And here I am watching my kids have a lot of fun, and I'm upset about it. And a little light bulb went off and said, you're an idiot. You ever have a light bulb that calls you an idiot? I, I get those a lot, so... And I'm thinking to myself, why am I excited and yelling at my kids when they're having a good time, playing in God's creation, not really destroying anything that's not going to get destroyed anyways, that they're going to outgrow? I am excited about nothing of importance at all. I have my priorities messed up. I'm more excited about my kids' shoes than I am about them having fun. And so my kids backed away from the mud puddle. That little light bulb went off. And I said, kids, your dad is wrong. I'm sorry. Now, I don't outgrow my shoes. So I took mine off. And I said, let's all jump in that dude. And we spent that afternoon jumping in the mud puddle. Why? Because suddenly a little light bulb went off and said, remember, remember, you know the end of the story. And life is short. Therefore, prioritize and be excited about what you should be excited about, but not about what you shouldn't be excited about. Let me, let me give it to you this way. Here's a great question to ask. Ready? If you could ask one question today. Does what is important in your life know what is important? Does what is important in your life know it's important? Does what is important in your life know it's important? Because again, we forget how temporary life is. We forget how short life is. And we overwhelm ourselves with the burdens of life. And we start taking what should be important for granted. Right? We come home. I've got all these burdens from work. 
Right? Because you have to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders, right? That's what your job is, right? It's to carry the weight of the world. And you come home from work and you're so upset and you're so angry and the first person you yell at is... I don't know who you yell at. It was time for you to answer. Right? Who do you yell at first? Right? Because you don't come home and be like, Oh, honey, I've had a terrible day. I love you. Come give me a kiss. Right? You come home and go, I can't believe you left the shoes in the middle of the floor. Right? You come home and go, I can't believe your homework's not done. You come home and go, I can't believe you didn't. Does the person who's important to you know they're important to you? Or do they know that your job's important to you? And that they're your venting post or whooping boy? Lord have mercy, right? Right? Yeah, because why? When we don't know the end of the story, I become overwhelmed with my burdens. I begin to take on all the burdens of life. We carry the burdens of the world upon our shoulders. Why? God's already won. Why do we do that? We end up looking more like the donkey, right? Overwhelmed. So many burdens we can't even touch the ground. When Jesus is saying, just hand them to me. You don't need to carry all of that. Because it changes our behavior. One side says, I got to get it all done. I got got, 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 got all this. And Jesus on the other side says, yeah, I got to get a thing done. I already wrote the end. Your job is to enjoy life. I didn't create you to be stressed. I created you to experience joy. And joy in its fullness. Let me tell you how this changes stuff. Ready? Changes your marriage. You know that? If you can get a good view of Revelation and say, God wins in the end, my time is short, it changes how you do marriage, it changes how you do every relationship. Let me stick with marriage for just a second. Did you know that you don't always have to like or get along with your spouse? Now, come on, folks. Some of you who have been married more than two weeks should have said, Amen. Right? Let me try it again. Did you know that you don't have to like or always get along with your spouse? There we go. All right. Now, here's what I want you to know. You don't have to. Nope. But in our culture, again, in our culture, I, I put a burden on that person. I think, hey, you've got to make me happy. Or I say, you have to make me happy. And I put that burden on them. And, and, and when they don't, and I don't find absolute happiness in that relationship, I want to end that relationship. But if I have a view that says, Hey, God wins in the end. Life is short. I bet my marriage has a purpose. Then I can go, my marriage can survive anything. Because we didn't live to make each other happy. We didn't get together because we said, I'm going to make you happy. We got together ultimately to bring God glory. That's why we did the marriage in the church in the first place. And that means that I may not always like you. But I will always love and respect you. And I will treat you the way you deserve to be treated. And we will work through anything anything. Why? Because life's short and in the end, God wins. In the end, God wins. Now think about that with every relationship. You have a friendship. What did your friendship break up over? Or what is your friendship struggling with? Is it really worth it when you think, hey, life's short, God wins in the end? Like the fact that they stole your lunch out of the job refrigerator, is it really that big a deal? Alright? That they, they went out, alright, and they, they left five minutes early. Is it really that big a deal? That they accidentally put a picture of Facebook of you that didn't show your best side? Is it really that big a deal? Ready? I'm about to say the F word. What if we learn to forgive? I know, some of you thought I was going to say a different word. But I just want you to know that I'm well aware that we will say that one much quicker than we will act upon the forgive word. But if I know that God wins and life is temporary, I'm willing to forgive. I'm willing to curb my anger and go, this isn't that important. So I'm at a red light. You know there are lights in Fairborn that take forever. 
Some of you are like me, and you will drive two blocks out of your way so that you don't go to that light. Amen? All right. I know where they're at. I'm like, I don't know why Satan put them in Fairborn. Okay? I'm well aware of it. I just, you know, I'll circle two blocks. I know it takes more time, but I don't have to wait. All right? And so I'm driving around, not waiting, and I will get there a little later, but I didn't have to sit at some stupid light that Satan put in there. Now, I, I forgot it one day. I was listening to something on, on, on the radio, and I sat at that light. And I was mad at myself because I'm sitting at the light, and the longer I sit there, the more I'm mad at the light. And I'm getting more and more angry, and I can feel it in my stomach. I can feel it gripping the steering wheel, and all of a sudden that light bulb turns off again. It says, you're an idiot. Okay, again, I told you that goes off for me a lot. All right? And that little light bulb went off in my head and said, hey, you're getting angry at an inanimate object. How smart are you? And it said to me, is this really that important? And I went, I want to be somewhere. And all I can hear my wife say is, you're never anywhere on time. Why do you care now? <laughs> and I thought to myself, am I changing the light? Am I solving the situation? I'm just getting more angry. And I thought, I am created to live forever. This world's temporary. In the end, I know God wins. I shouldn't be excited about this at all. Man, we get excited about the wrong stuff, don't we? What if instead we all went out and started jumping in the mud puddles? Whatever makes you happy, Kathy. And what if instead we looked at our relationships and said, I want those who are important to know they're important. Some of you have friends that have never heard you tell them why you care about them and what they mean to you. Some of you have kids that you've not sat down and given them a blessing of verbal love in a long time. Some of you have parents that you haven't said, Mom, Dad, I've been out for a long time. I was a jerk. I took for granted all the love you gave me and all the dishes and all the laundry and all the money you pour... I, I just want you to know I love you. Some of you have spouses that for too long have come home and you've unloaded burdens you were never meant to carry. And you need to say to them, I'm sorry, I want to be better. I love you and this is why. I love you and this is why. Listen. Listen. If I can live every day knowing that God wins in the end, this life is temporary, but we get to live forever, it'll help me remember and remind what's important in my life that it is important. This is why we study Revelation. Because it changes who I am today knowing we win in the end. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help us to number our days. Help us to number our days that we may prioritize you and those that are important to us over all things temporary. Amen. So we got... Uh, couple questions. What I did is I sat down with a couple people and I said, hey, if we're walking through a message on Revelation, what's one or two things that you would want to absolutely know? And I told you we would do some Q&A if, if you have some. And I just want you to know when we talk about Revelation, I want to be clear, most of what you want to know, we don't know either. Okay? So, so uh, I'll just start there, but we have a couple questions that uh, we'll, we'll start with here. Uh, so the first one is, what makes this story because it is a story. What makes it different than the fairy tales that, that we hear, that we read, that we see played out? Yeah. So uh, I think that's a great place to start because as you and I talk to people who don't know Jesus or aren't in a church environment, 
they probably know enough from Hollywood, the H, not the B, that Revelation not only is a scary story, but it's a gruesome, terrible, gory story that, again, if I don't read the last two chapters about heaven that we're going to cover next week, it is a scary story. Even for those of us in the church, we go, man, that doesn't look like a good time to be around. Let's, I hope God takes us before then, right? And, and here's what happens is that we begin to confuse that story, right? If I don't have a church background or relationship with Jesus... There's no difference from that story than like a, a fairy tale's grim story or a Count Dracula. I mean, it, it becomes this really terrible end of the world Terminator story type thing going on, right? And here's the difference. <clears throat> we ought to go backwards to Jesus, right? It separates it from being a fairy tale or again, something that Hollywood made up when we go, my story is rooted in a historical figure that lived, that died, and there was an empty tomb. And again, you and I uh, can be in conversations with people who believe that the empty tomb is empty for entirely different reasons. And I don't believe any of them have, a, have much logic or reason behind them. And so my belief in the end of the story is based on the fact that there was an empty tomb and Jesus rose from the dead. That's where our faith starts. My faith goes out from there, both back into the beginning of the book and forward to the end of the book. All right? To where I see Jesus giving predictions. I know that John was one of Jesus' disciples. And that I believe because of X and X and X evidence. Again, as we just, we could tend to get another hour and, and talk about all that evidence. I believe I can trust the gospel that this is actually one of John's visions. He says this is a vision of what happened. It doesn't mean I understand it. It doesn't mean I get it. I mean, John doesn't even get it as he's writing it. But I believe because I, faith starts with the resurrection that I can trust the book of Revelation. I'm going to skip that one and go to this one because we have two that are right. coming online. Uh, so, I don't know about you, and I don't know about you, but I think the book of Revelation is incredibly complex. Anybody else agree with that? All right. It is really difficult to understand. I mean, we've got all these crazy things that happen in the book of Revelation. So, Help us, help, give us some tools and resources and ways that we can better understand how to even approach reading the book. Yeah, so uh, go to the last slide for me, guys. Um, what I want to do is I just want to take a glimpse of something here. <laughs> Revelation has like seven bowls, it has seven trumpets, and it's all talking about what's going to happen at the end. All right, <laughs> and, and let me just give you a couple glimpses uh, as you read through it here. I, I hope you can see these. All right? With the seven trumpets, you're going to have one-third of the vegetation of the earth that's, that's burned up. And again, here's where we get in trouble. People read that and they go, oh my gosh, that was the napalm we used in Vietnam. And, or, hey, that sounds like a nuclear blast. Like it could eat up one-third of the vegetation of the world. And all those are possibilities. All those could be true. I, I don't know. I don't want to be crazy crazy guy over here and start associating everything, but I also don't want to be, I've ignored it all. I want to live in the middle and go, it just sounds like we're getting closer, which I've heard people say, that's your cop out. And I go, yes, but it's true. Every day that goes by, all I know is we're getting closer. And I know what it looks like in the end. So when you tell me it's happening now, I go, no, I've read about it. <laughs> we're not there right now. Okay. Uh, the second Trump, it says, one-third of the sea becomes blood, and one-third of the ships and life are destroyed in the water. Uh, and one, trumpet number three, one-third of the water turns bitter. Uh, we have the stain of the sun and the moon at trumpet number uh, four. Again, I just, here's what I know. When we read this, I don't try to put it into this is happening now. I just read it and go, I'm pretty sure I won't miss one-third of the water becoming bitter and poison. Like, I think that'll make national news. So if I'm around when this happens, I don't think I'll miss it. Now, here's the final thing I would say to just help us understand that. I don't know that I have to understand Revelation to get that God wins. Again, I really, when I read it, I get to the last two chapters and go, oh good, something I understand. There's going to be a new heaven and new earth. We're going to cover all that next week. But here's the big question I always get. Look, there's pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation people. There's people that think, hey, we're Christians. Those who love Jesus are all going to get taken up before the bad stuff happens. There are people who think, like, hey, I, God knows I can only handle so much. I'm going to get taken up in the middle of it. And there's people that think we're going to endure it all and get taken up in the end. And they get all in fights and arguments about that because it's really important, right? And I just keep telling them I'm, I'm a pan-tribulation guy. I figure it's all going to pan out the way God wants it to, so I'm not going to worry about it, okay? And so I, you can be a pan-tribulationist too. It says, I don't know, don't care, not going to worry about it, right? All right. Okay, we, got, we got two more. Um, 
how do we make sure that we win with God? So, uh, one of the, the, the most important things that we can walk away with is knowing that Jesus is coming back. And that we never have to be good enough. Right? I never have to go, oh, I hope I was good enough to make the cut. Like, I don't know if I'm going to get up in the air with God because I started jumping the other day and I don't get high enough. I, again, we, we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus sacrificed on the cross as the blood of the Lamb. Made us pure. The Bible says we became the bride of Christ, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, ready for the wedding that's going to take place midair. So it's through Jesus Christ that we can know we're ready. I make him my king. I follow him with all my life. Okay, so the last one. This is uh, from somebody watching online. Um, she says, I hear a lot of people say I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in organized religion. They tell me they are good people, and they try to do good things and feel this is enough to go to heaven. I try to share my story of being away from the church for so long and finally finding my home. I don't want to be the crazy church girl. That will scare them away. But I fear for their salvation. What is the best way to approach these people? Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little more next week in the sense of, again, I don't want to scare people into heaven or a relationship with Jesus. But I also, if I've seen the end of the game, my dad does this because we, we don't often get to watch it. He'll call me up and go, hey, Ohio State won. You going to watch it? I'm like, dad, I, I can't DVR it like you did. It, it's over. I won't get to see it. But again, he, he will often call Tater Eye up and go, did they win? Uh, because we'll get it on our phones because he doesn't know how to do that yet, apparently. And uh, I'll say, yeah, they won. You can watch the game, <laughs> which is always funny for me to say. But uh, we have a responsibility to tell people we know the end, right? And so here's why I like kind of the message that we had today where you don't have to carry those burdens. Like God wins. Why do you want to live with the stress of the world? That, that sounds to me much more like a message Jesus brought. Right? Why do you want to live with all that stress? God wins in the end. Why, why do you want to live, live constantly upset and angry? Why do you want to live sacrificing relationship after relationship after relationship over stuff that's not important? God wins in the end. This is short. We get to live forever. We should figure out how to do this now. And so I would approach it from, again, how do I talk to people about what God gets to give them, what God wants for them, rather than all the doom and gloom of Revelation. Because if I can begin to have someone see the beauty of God, they'll come to understand the book of Revelation much later. That's not the first step in coming to know Jesus. The first step in coming to know Daddy is to know Daddy's a good, good father. Good? Right. Any, anything else? If you're waving a hand, I just need you to brother. shout. I can't see. Keep waiting for your brother to ask a question. You got any? <laughs> You usually have a zinger at the end. <laughs> I see a hand. I think I see a hand. Go for it. You gotta, oh, is it Lacey? You got to speak really loud, dear, because I can't hear you even in a room. Okay, so how do you reconcile the sermon from last week of God doesn't always get what he wants and the reality of hell with the fact that, yes, this week in the end we're saying God wins? Yeah. Again, that Did I get that right? Is yeah. that correct? So, I, I, again, I think C.S. Lewis imagery of the cruise ship is the best way to help us with that. That the cruise ship's going to dock. It's going to start here and it's going to end here no matter what happens. God wants everybody to behave a certain way and enjoy the cruise ship and when we get there to depart into heaven. But the reality of it is those who don't believe in Jesus when the cruise ship gets there, they're not going to make it into heaven. Uh, our behavior on the cruise ship determines our belief system on the cruise ship. What we value on the cruise ship determines, again, when I get there, do I get the opportunity to march into heaven. But the, the cruise ship's getting there one way or another. The, the book of Revelation is, is written. The end is going to happen as it is written, no matter what we do, no matter what we say. We can't change the end of the cruise ship. We can change what happens on the cruise ship. We have minor impact in that sense. It's a macro, uh, uh, excuse me, a micro impact. Well, and I, w I, would, I would say too that God's winning in the end isn't that God's getting what he wants. 
God's winning in the end is that we don't have to live in sin. We don't have to be eternally, uh, you know, put in in this place that we don't like or that we have put ourselves in. You know, God's winning in the end is Jesus rising from the dead. Yeah. And so it's, it's not necessarily a matter of God wins, everybody goes to heaven, regardless of their life. God wins in the end is me knowing that I have been forgiven and I have been redeemed and I get to live eternally. That, that's what God's victory is. We are, you know, Paul says we are more than conquerors because of what God has done in our life. That is the win. Am, yeah, I, am it, I right? It, yeah, just to add to that, I would say, remember, it's not about us. It's always about God and God's glory. In the end, God gets all the glory, uh, which is what we should all be living for. Uh, and so in the end, God does win. I mean, the whole story brings God glory. It may not be that God, everybody gets in heaven with God, Again, because God gave us free will. And so for God to take that away means that God has to go against his own glory. God values you enough that he will not force you to be in heaven with him. Uh, that's how much an amazing love that God has. Alright, next week we cover the end. Chapter 21 of Revelation. Oh, you don't want to miss this. We talk about heaven and the beauty that's coming. Until then, do those who are important to you know they're important to you. Live life as if tomorrow's going to be the last day. May those who are important to you be told that they're important to you. Why? Because we win in the end. So stop bringing your burdens home. And give them to God. You are blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.